test, test, test. This is a PowerPoint test. Test, test, test. Sorry, I turned the mic off so that I could get the PowerPoint set up and on. All right, well, I will just start internally monologuing uh, because this is a wonderful morning and anybody at Harborview that's listening in right now, hello. Sorry to put you through all this, but uh, you know, that's a thing that we're doing.
is going to be a good hour talk. I told you they weren't that tough. <laughs> People are coming in. All right, good morning. Today I'm going to give you a little update on ICD-10 because it's here and now at the UW. I changed this title slide yesterday and added the uh, three dates, 2014, 2015, or 2016 because of what's going on in D.C. So if you, this is the email I received yesterday from Sarah Lucas who's running the program program director for ICDTM implementation at the UW, and you can sort of see this summarized was what ha what's happening in D.C., that on Monday evening, the Senate approved a vote by 64 to 35, uh, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014, which w basically resets the SGR, or doesn't solve it, but solves it, or kicks the can down the road for another year. And this was added to that bill. And that means that if the president signs this, and we don't think he'll sign it before Thursday at the earliest, um, then it'll push the deadline back another year to 2015. The University of Washington really hasn't figured out what to do, as you see by the second paragraph. Uh, they'll decide that likely at the Executive Steering Committee, which I attend on uh, the first Thursday of every month. So we'll see what happens. You can see this is signed by the uh, people in charge of the program. So with that, my objectives are really to introduce you to the structure and requirements of ICD-10, identify what we know are the orthopedic documentation gaps needed to meet those requirements, share some estimates of costs and reductions in physician productivity, motivate you to learn it because eventually it will be implemented. If not, ICD-10 will go to ICD-11 and motivate you to help remediate our practices processes that's both clinic, inpatient, so that we attain ICD-10 compliance. This means that you're going to need to educate yourself and your staff. I give this talk to others, so this talk is also geared to private practitioners, if there are any in the audience listening. We want you to start documenting to ICD-10 specificity now. Make sure your compliance is updated in terms of both your EMR and your practice management system because paper bills would become passe. You'll see there are just too many new diagnoses to fit on one, two, or even three pages of super bills unless your practice is very specific. And then prior to full implementation, you need to make sure you test your claims management processes both internally and externally. That includes billing services, claims clearing houses, and you'll see why some consultants recommend opening a line of credit. So ICD-10 impacts pretty much all areas. Uh, it impacts physicians biggest and most at the two pink area boxes in terms of the documentation physicians need to increase for the increased specificity and to be trained in finding the appropriate codes and terminology, and then the coding. You can see that it says that the codes increase uh, a lot. You need more detailed knowledge of anatomy because these codes are very anatomically precise uh, and we're, we'll, we're actually, the university will be using ICD-9 and ICD-10 concurrently until ICD-10 is implemented. ICD-10 was uh, mandated in 2009. This was not part of Obamacare, but due to this bill, the modifications to the medical data code set in 2009, and uh, ICD-10-CM and PCS, which is the hospital billing side, analogous to CPT, uh, replace ICD-9 at that time. 
They also mandated a change in the claims form, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the change from the 4010 standard to the 5010 standard for electronic uh, transactions, which also affects the paper claim form called the HICFA 1500. So until last Monday, the compliance date was going to be October 1, 2014. It's still that unless the President signs the bill. ICD-10 will be switched on then, and ICD-9 will be switched off as the HIPAA and CMS standard. And if you continue to use ICD-9 codes after the transition date, whether it's 10 one 14 or 15, then you'll be denied payment. Again, this does not have any effect on CPT. That's how physicians or professionals report their surgical and evaluation and management services. CPT and the HICSPIX level two and three codes will continue to be used for physician and ambulatory services, including physician visits to inpatient supplies. What we'll use is the ICD-10 codes to substantiate the medical necessity for those services. So what are the impacts on practices? Basically, claims will be rejected after October 1st, resulting in disruption in payments and lets you transition. This will require significant changes in terms of physician behaviors, especially documentation. So this is not just an IT project, but it will impact pretty much all facets of medical care and manual processes. Super bills will be worthless because of the vast number of medical uh, diagnoses. And we, we are planning, or we have transitioned as of April 1st within the University of Washington, and uh, once ICD-10 codes are used or ICD-10 documentation is used, we'll crosswalk back to ICD-9 for claim submission. What have been the estimates on revenue and physician productivity? Well, the increased documentation requirements are purported to result in somewhere between 10 and probably close to 15 percent increase in physician documentation time. That's in terms of capturing the information and reporting it. And they suggest that this will likely result in a decrease in practice revenue by 4 to 5 percent. The range has been reported from 2 to 6 percent. CMS has suggested that denials will increase around 300 percent in their memorandum, up to 6 percent from the current 2 percent in CMS denials. Obviously, denials are slightly higher in commercial payers. Because of this decrease in practice and physician revenue, consultants have recommended using your reserves or retained earnings in your nonprofit or for-profit practices or obtain a line of credit as a bridge. The decrement in reduction in physician productivity and the length of that will be variable and it will depend on the type of practice you have as well as your payer mix, but some pundits have suggested this will be in excess of one year and perhaps in perpetuity. So if we look at just coders' productivity losses, ICD-10 was implemented in Canada in a rolling uh, schedule from 2001 to 2005. This is the eastern provinces started first. And just before implementation, you can see this three hospital system in Toronto, the Humber River Hospital, looked at their, excuse me, their coder productivity. The first column at the left was right before implementation, May 1st, and you can see coders who often will put anywhere from 10 to 30 different ICD codes with a given hospital discharge were co able to code about 4.62 charts per, per hour. Um, day surgery, 1068 and emergency room 1037. They're not as complex as inpatient admissions. Three months after initiation, you can see that they had a decrement in coding productivity from professional coders by 52 percent, and one year later it still remained down at 18 percent. So that was the experience in Canada. We have obviously no experience in the U.S. As far as Time for physicians, I know this is a very busy slide, but this is one of the estimates of cost back in 2006 from the Hay Group. The big thing I want to show you here is that they predicted physicians will require somewhere between four to six hours of training. Newer data suggests that may be higher, and uh, especially for orthopedics. Nockham Senate Advisors in 2008 came out with estimates of practice costs. Depending on the size of the practices, you can see three columns for a small practice was three docs, 
a typical medium practice with 10 providers and a large practice with 100 providers with estimates anywhere between 83,000 and nearly 7 million. This was revised in February of this year, and you can see the old data there and the new data here, which increases those estimates by three to four, uh, two to three, or almost fourfold. Um, okay. Let's go back and look at the history of ICD-10 in the U.S. In 1893, Jacques Bertillon introduced the classification of causes of death at the Congress of International Statistic Institute. In 1898, the American Public Health Association recommended adoption of this, and in 1900, ICD-1 was used to classify death. It was not used early on to classify disease or morbidity. The sixth revision is when it became two volumes post-World War II, and this is the first volume to include morbidity or diseases in addition to death. And its title was modified to the International Statistical Classification of Diseases, Injuries, and Causes of Death. Uh, in 1948, the World Health Organization assumed responsibility for preparing and publishing the revisions, and then they sponsored the revisions approximately every decade thereafter. You can see the ninth edition, which is the one we're using today, was revised in 1975, and we adopted it in 1977. It has 14,000 diagnoses codes and an additional 4,000 procedural codes, of which, again, the hospitals use to report physician services in the hospital. The CM, or clinical modification version, by, is used in the U.S., and managed by the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics, and it's used for both diagnostic and procedural codes associated with inpatient, outpatient, and physician office care in the U.S. Volume 1 is the tabular listing, Volume 2 is the index, and Volume 3 is the one you don't find in most physician offices, but it has the procedural codes. Volume, excuse me, ICD-10 is also two different code sets, the CM version of diagnoses, and the procedural coding system. And this is, uh, its use was started in the world in about 1994 and represents about 69,000 diagnostic codes. And if you combine both the procedural codes and the diagnostic codes, it's about 155,000. It was adopted for reporting mortality in the U.S. in 1999. So it's been used in the U.S., the mortality sections, for 15 years. The rest of the world has been using this, and it was adopted uh, throughout the world by different countries uh, in the mid-90s and early 2000s. You can see some of the dates in Australia, Canada, and Sweden. Up until Monday, we were to implement this October 1st, and it would replace ICD-9, and with regular updates beginning this year. So here's a, a list of the industrial world, and you can sort of see the different countries around the world where uh, this has been adopted. China in 2002, France 96, the UK in 95, and as I said, Canada in a rolling five-year period between 2001 and 2005 from east to west. So the history of ICD in the U.S. in terms of use for mortality is, as you see here, pretty much it was designed to be updated every, every year, every decade, I'm sorry. ICD-11 is the first alpha draft is already available. It was available uh, several years ago, and it's going to use Web 2 principles for multi-author drafts. The final draft was to be submitted to the World Health Organization for official endorsement in 15. And yesterday I received a copy of this press release from CMS, and I take your attention to the first two paragraphs. I'll blow those up. Secretary of Health and Human Services Kathleen Sebelius announced this morning that after conferring with administration and congressional leadership and in consultation with stakeholder groups, she has decided that Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries and the nation as uh, a whole, I guess, are best served by adoption of the most recent coding scheme, ICD-11, rather than ICD-10. Advantages to 11 include a richer and more clinically appropriate set of terms that are in close alignment with the international standard. The World Health Organization is close to release of 11, and the year of postponement in the move away from 9 gives us the opportunity to join the global community in the use of the most current international standard. What do you think of that? April Fools. <laughs> because you can see it's, uh, 
what was released on the first and their misspellings. But this is what I received yesterday and I was <laughs> found that to be humorous. <laughs> and I can see you guys see that too. <laughs> But, but who knows, because I gave you the slide before, which shows that uh, it does fit with what's happened. Okay, um, Monday, April 1st. Excellent. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving on. The rationale for conversion is that ICD-9 is 30 years old, as I said, published in 77, adopted in 79. And ICD-10 offers many improvements. Uh, it really allows us to now capture disease and procedural information longitudinally to understand the progression of disease. And it uh, is hoped that it will enhance the accurate payment for services so as to decrease supporting documentation requirements. In other words, you can report so many different diagnoses or comorbidities that it may not require uh, as many appeals after initial denials of your claims. And then it's also purported to reduce fraud. Okay. There's a five-fold increase in the number of diagnosis codes from ICD-9 to ICD-10. And if I, this is a screenshot from Codex for meniscus in ICD-9, you can see 25 results. If I do the same search in ICD-10 for meniscus, about 250, and you can now see why these won't fit on a super bill. Okay? If I do the same search in ICD-9 for tibia fracture, I get 20 results. So the first was five times, but here's what it is in ICD-10, 1,952. And if I just look at ICD-10 for femur fracture, nearly 3,000 different codes. And you can just scroll down that list for pages and pages and pages. And that's why super bills become passe. You're going to have to capture your codes and charges electronically. The nice thing is that, uh, that uh, Codex has these different ways to search. You can search by a pick list, which helps you identify the terms. And if we have time at the end of this presentation, I'll demonstrate it. However, one of the things of note is that if you look at the ICD-10 column of nearly 70,000 codes in the US, the rest of the world is not using quite a robust code set. That's because we're using the clinical modification version, which is designed only for the US. So when we look at implementation in other countries, it's not nearly as complex as it is in the US. Don't ask me why. So let's contrast ICD-9 and 10. I've already reviewed the number of codes, but you can see uh, on the procedural coding system side, there's 87,000 and a 22% increase in the number of procedural codes. So that is really impacting hospital coders. Uh, three to five digits max versus seven digits max, only numeric in ICD-9, alphanumeric in ICD-10. There's no placeholder. Because in ICD-10, a seventh character is required frequently, especially for musculoskeletal codes, you need a, a place holder in either the fourth, fifth, or sixth category if the seventh digit is required. There is no left and right specified in ICD-9. There is in ICD-10, including codes for bilateral, for example, osteoarthritis. Injuries were grouped by injury, so you'd look at fracture, for example, and then femur in ICD-9, whereas in ICD-10, everything's grouped by anatomical site, meaning you might go to femoral head, and then you see fracture. Fractures, for example, or injuries were only classified as open or closed, whereas now they require documentation for the Gastillo type of open injury. Type 1 and 2 are classified together or grouped together in type 3, A, B, and C, and then closed. And they're in their expanded combination codes, and I'll explain that. So the ICD-10 code set looks like this. It's got a decimal point after the first three digits, which denote the category. Uh, you can see which Characters are alpha or numeric or alphanumeric. The second four categories are or characters specify increased specificity in terms of etiology or for fractures, anatomical site, or for medical illnesses, severity. For example, you can have diabetes that's poorly controlled. And then there's a seventh character extension, which is required for many, many, many musculoskeletal codes, but not all others. So, it's in two parts. The index to diseases is about 1,340 pages. Then there's a table of drugs and chemicals. And then there's an index 
to external causes, which I'll review. Second part is the tabular list with uh, chapters, which are different than ICD-9 and reordered and subdivided into sub-chapters and categories, which I'll show you in a moment. Here are the new parts of it. I said laterality, the X is a placeholder. The seventh character denotes the encounter type and the healing status for fractures and other injuries. Injuries are grouped again by anatomical site rather than injury. And there's a distinction between interoperative complications and post-procedural complications. Conventions are very similar in terms of not elsewhere classifiable or NEC uh, and not otherwise specified, which means the physician did not specify laterality, for example, left and right, and may lead to a rejection or denial of your claim if you should know whether a limb, uh, the injured limb was left and right. There are other codes as well. Uh, there are two types of notes, includes, ex, uh, includes notes are the same. Exclude one means not coded here, I mean don't use that code and you have to actually look at the code set to understand whether it says exclude one or exclude two. And exclude two means not part of this condition, it may be coded together if appropriate. ICD-9 used the 4010 transaction standard, which meant that when you submit a claim for a physician service, whether it's an evaluation and management service or a operation, you could append or link to it to a maximum of four diagnoses. In ICD-10, the 5010 transaction standard is in effect. In fact, that went into effect April 1st, and now you can link up to 12 diagnoses to each service. And so increasing the specificity of your patient's uh, comorbidities and complexity will be important in terms of tracking longitudinality of disease and, and identifying your patient population as being, for example, more complex than another doctor. So those are the two keys there, that now uh, making sure you list all diagnoses that are appropriate and pertinent are there. What are some other differences between uh, 9 and 10? Specificity and detail have been greatly expanded, hence the increased number of codes. There are literally thousands of injury codes. In ICD-9, there are 57 diabetes codes, and that expands to 251 in ICD-10. There are 47 codes for alcohol and substance abuse and for alcohol use and dependence. There are 150 codes for pressure ulcers by location, depth, and stage. They want us to also report our complications or other medical misadventures. And there are lots of codes for complications of internal prosthetic or uh, devices, implants, and grafts, including breakage of an implant, mechanical loosening, wear, instability, osteolysis, dislocation, periprosthetic fracture, all of those are now reportable and classifiable. There are 27 codes for intraoperative and post-procedural complications, which means injury to another structure, such as an intraoperative fracture, for example, while inserting a femoral component, or injury to another organ, such as a laceration to a nerve, a vessel, a name vessel, uh, or a post hematoma. Also, disorders of uh, the muscular system associated with And finally, the for complications of a procedure such as uh, a retained foreign body. So all of these are now reportable. Another difference is the expanded use of combination codes. Combination codes are of two types, a diagnosis plus a manifestation of that disease or uh, a diagnosis plus an associated complication. So in diabetes, you might have type 2 diabetes with peripheral neuropathy, meaning a diagnosis plus a manifestation, or osteoporosis with a pathologic fracture. There's also been some elimination of combination codes. You can no longer report a both bone forearm fracture or a distal radius and ulna fracture. Both of those fractures have to be identified independently and will require two different codes. Also, a tibia and fibular fracture, both fractures have to be defined uh, in terms of uh, the anatomy and the anatomical pattern independently. 
The seventh character I alluded to before, they're used in certain chapters, but throughout the musculoskeletal system. And if it has an applicable seventh character, it must be reported. X is the placeholder in case that there are only five characters, for example, up to that seventh character requirement. And I'll show you an example of the seventh character. For fractures, there are 16 different potential seventh uh, alpha characters. And you can see these are grouped in sets of three. And the first one, uh, A, which would be initial encounter for a closed fracture, B and C are initial encounter for a type one and two open fracture, C is a initial encounter for a type or C fracture. Whereas D, E, and F are a subsequent encounter for a fracture with routine healing, whether it's closed or open. And then you have to specify at each visit in the post-op period, whether there's routine healing, delayed healing, non-union, or malunion. And finally, there's the S for a sequela, or a complication results from a previous injury. The, the ones A, D, and S are used throughout um, orthopedics. And obviously, all 16 are really only used for open injuries, such as fractures. Let's look at an example of the structure of ICD-10. And this is for a subtrochanteric femur. If you re remember, the S72 or the first three characters are for category. S is from the injury chapter. Seven denotes femur. And two is a fracture. The point two says the location. Definition of increased specificity. The one of the point two one denotes displacement. Because a seventh character is required for this open fracture initial encounter, the X is used as a placeholder in the sixth uh, position. So X, so excuse me, S 72.21 XB is a displaced subtrochanteric fracture of the right femur initial encounter for an open fracture type one or two. That gives you some idea of what this code set looks like. Let's look at the chapters within ICD-10. There are 21 chapters within the ICD-10 uh, lexicon, of which only a handful are of interest to orthopedic surgeons. If you're a musculoskeletal oncologist, neoplasms, chapter 2. Chapter 6, disease of the nervous system. Chapters uh, 12, skin and sub-Q tissues. But the workhorses will be the M, excuse me, the 13th chapter with M codes. You can see the codes are alpha by the first letter, which is disease of the musculoskeletal system and connective tissue. 19 is the injury chapter for poisoning and certain other consequences of external cause. And then there's uh, external causes of morbidity, which I'll also review. So chapter 6, again, disease of the nervous system have these examples, such as nerve and nerve root and plexus disorders, polyneuropathies, carpal tunnel syndrome, cerebral palsies, other paralytic syndromes. And you can see some examples of the codes towards the bottom of the slide. Chapter 13 is the workhorse for orthopedics. It has all the itises and oses, meaning tendonitis, arthritis, osteoporosis, osteomyelitis, ankylosis, many, many more. And these are some of the things that are atraumatic conditions or as a result of a prior traumatic condition, such as tendinopathies. In this chapter, the specific bone, joint, or muscle and tendon involved must be identified. You're going to use multiple codes for each site, unless there's a multiple site exists, such as osteoarthritis could be polyarticular osteoarthritis. A seventh category is required. A, again, means active treatment. D means uh, uh, established. And S is sequela. Because osteoporosis is felt to be a disease, it's found in this chapter, even if you have a fracture, uh, because that's a pathological fractures are found here. It's not a traumatic condition fracture. The bone shouldn't have failed in normal use. And so you have the M80 for uh, pathologic fracture by the site of the fracture and without at M81 if there's no fracture just for osteoporosis. I'm oh, sorry. Chapter 18 is uh, symptom signs, abnormal clinical and laboratory findings. There are some musculoskeletal conditions in here, such as abnormalities of gait and mobility, clicking hip is in here, and other general signs and symptoms. Chapter 19 is the workhorse for the musculoskeletal traumatologist. Again, it's 
ordered by body part. All fractures and dislocations are here, including the spine, as are sprains and strains, superficial injuries, contusions, lacerations, blisters, foreign bodies, uh, as well as the T codes for uh, failure of prosthesis, periprosthetic osteolysis, and failure of fixation, for example. Now, if you look at chapter 19, again, those are the, it's the S chapter for the most part. You can see it's arranged the second by the second character anatomically. It follows a template. So S0 is injuries to the head, S1 to the neck, S2 to the thorax, 3 to the abdomen, lower back, lumbar spine, pelvis, and working down to S9 to the ankle and foot. Notice the third character is not there. It's either between 0 and 9. The third character is also templated. And so 0 is a superficial injury, 1 is an open wound, 2 is a fracture. Remember, S72 was a subtrochanteric femur fracture. The S from the injury chapter, the 7 for the femur, and the 2 for the fracture. So anytime you f see a 2 in an S code, you know it's a fracture. A 3 is a dislocation. Four is an injury to a nerve, and so on. And if you have both a fracture with a nerve injury, you're going to have two separate codes by anatomical site. Seven's a crush, eight, eight is an avulsion or amputation, and nine is other, other or unspecified. So those, again, the first three digits denote the category and are very specific about the injury. The seventh place indicates the type of visit, as we said before, the type of healing or the openness of a fracture. So once again, just looking at the, the subtrochanteric femur fracture codes, you can see how the category S72 is femur and then fracture, then more specific anatomically. So let's now look at chapter 20. This is the chapter that's gotten most attention in the news and in the lay press, because codes can now be used to capture cause, how the injury or health care condition happened. Though there's no national requirement for this, many of our regional payers do want this to determine whether this was a motor vehicle crash or an on-the-job injury, as another example. The intent, whether it was intentional, accidental, or uh, unintentional. Qualifiers are also helpful. Where the activity took place, what specific activity the in person was engaged in, and the person's status, meaning are they employed or active duty military, as an example. These replaced the ICD-9E codes, which were also used for traumatic condition. They're said to be only needed to be reported once at the initial patient presentation in the health system. However, UWP would like you to record this in any claim, for example, that it's being submitted so the documentation stands alone. If this is in your admit note and you're submitting a claim for a surgical procedure, it's best to include these as part of the diagnoses for the surgical procedure should the claim need to be reviewed. They submit one document, your op note, which will have the uh, activity codes or external causes listed as well. So examples of external causes of morbidity include accidents, such as V03.10XA, which is a pedestrian who's on foot, hit, struck by an auto as the initial, um, initial visit, A. V0 through V99 are transport vehicle accidents, such as trucks and buses, or hit by falling objects, watercraft, snowmobile, dune buggy. Uh, V95 to 97 are air and space and transport accidents, and there are just many, many more. So the, this, is, this increased specificity is pretty interesting. Here's bitten by a duck initial encounter, okay? W61.61XA, the small x is a placeholder. Note that external causes also include complications of medical uh, and surgical care, misadventures, to the patient during surgical and medical care. I showed you some of those codes before. Medical devices associated with adverse incidents and diagnostic and therapeutic use. And finally, other procedures as a code, as a cause for abnormal reaction of the patient or later complication. You can qualify these external causes, again, as I said, by whether there's been evidence of alcohol involvement, and that means you need to re report their uh, blood alcohol level. These are stratified by, B excuse me, by um, blood alcohol level, BAL. If you know this, 
otherwise it's non-specified. You can specify the place of occurrence, the activity, which may be different than the cause. I'll show you an example. The person's status and whether this is a nosocomial condition. So as far as place of occurrence, pretty much anywhere in the world can be identified. Y92.030 is in the kitchen of an apartment as the place of occurrence. Y92.113, driveway of a children's home and orphanage. Uh, Y92.234, which would be a medical misadventure that occurred in the, ho in the operating room as a hospital, as an example. Other activities include things like ice hockey, computer keyboarding, for example, for carpal tunnel, bike riding, refereeing a sports activity, or if you're injured as a spectator at an event, Y93.82. Injuries received while playing a brass instrument, Y93.J4. <laughs> External cause has to do with uh, what the, the status of the, the individual at the time they're injured. And so a civilian activity done for income or pay, meaning on the job injury, Y99.0. Someone's active duty military or other external cause status, which generally includes leisure activity, recreational, sports, student activity, volunteer activities, or unspecified. So let's look at a couple of clinical examples. Post-traumatic shortening of the left radius due to previous comminuted fracture at the distal end of the left forearm as a result of a snowmobile accident. So Doug, what's happening now? You have unequal limb length, which is acquired. M21.732. This is not an acute injury. It's in the M chapter, meaning it's a musculoskeletal condition. It's uh, a sequela of an unspecified fracture of the lower end of the left radius, S52.502S, the S denoting uh, the sequela. And how did it happen? V86.92S, unspecified occupant of a snowmobile injured in a non-traffic accident. Obviously your history, I'll have to find out if it was a snowmobile in the Midwest on a street or a non-traffic uh, accident. Here's another one, an osteoporotic fracture uh, with an insufficient fracture of the right femur. What's happening now? M80.051A, age-related osteoporosis with current pathological fracture, right femur, initial encounter. The A is the initial encounter, seventh character required. And this is the result of a osseous defect, meaning osteoporosis, in the right pelvic region or thigh, M89.751. So you can see that there are a few peculiarities with the ICD-10 code set more than the ICD-9 code set. You're required to report a primary diagnosis and if it's a sequela of some past injury or disease, it's also very helpful to capture all pertinent medical comorbidities that may have impact on that injury or medical or orthopedic or musculoskeletal diagnosis. Should also try to determine the external cause and the activity. And as I said, the new claim form accepts up to 12 diagnoses codes for every physician's service. Obviously, there are lots of opportunities for errors, omissions, and denials. So let's now try to identify the gaps in our current documentation and see how orthopedic surgeons need to improve their documentation. Figure out what additional history elements may be needed, how else you have to document your physical exam and interpretation of images, which will be important, and implications just for assessment and diagnosis. So the University of Washington started this ICD-10 program back in 2011. And uh, early last year, they did a gap analysis looking at multiple medical records of different specialties. In orthopedics, they looked at 679 charts, and to that they combined an additional 67 charts from spine. And they used in industry compliance guidelines and looked at top visits and DRGs by volume. They looked at common hip, knee, shoulder, and major joint replacement diagnoses and other conditions that we see. So these are the common diagnoses that we see at the University of Washington, and they looked at uh, um, a bunch of charts. Overall, they found that we do capture and document laterality quite well. For example, for meniscal tears, we identify whether it's the left or right knee, whether it's the medial or lateral meniscus, and the type of tear if that's known, meaning bucket handle, horizontal, whatever. 
Arthritis is documented fairly, as well, too, by type and the location. But where we really fall down as orthopedic surgeons is we do not document the, the uh, pertinent comorbidities affecting either our treatment or the patient's disease as well. And that needs to be improved by all of us. As far as fractures, we're really good about documenting the specific sites of the fractures, but we don't always document how many parts the proximal humerus is. So one of the ICD-10 code set about fractures is that proximal humerus fractures are either two, three, or four parts. We also don't say whether fractures are displaced or non-displaced, and the ICD-10 code set requires you say whether it's displaced or non-displaced, but displaced is the default. They figure that if you've noted a fracture, it's most likely displaced. We often, we do capture whether a fracture is open or closed, but not all of us are good in specifying whether that fracture is gastillo type 1, 2, 3, A, B, or C uh, open. Closed is the default if you don't say open, but if you say open, you should document whether it's type 1, 2, 3, A, B, or C. And in subsequent episodes of care, the type of fracture healing is not specified routinely in our clinic notes and must now be specified as routine healing, delayed healing, non-union, or uh, malunion. So we need to step up our documentation to support the specificity and detail of ICD-10. Let's go look at some more documentation requirements. For ankle fractures, codes, there are specific codes for medial malleolus, lateral malleolus, bimalleolar, trimalleolar, meson nerve, and pilon fractures. In ICD-9, there is no code for uh, pilon fracture or meson nerve. Those are new codes introduced in ICD-10. Fracture subluxations and fracture dislocations, we need to code the fracture unless the associated dislocation is felt to be primary. In other words, the dislocation is subsumed in the fracture code unless, for example, the dislocation is primary. Um, so for example, a, a posterior wall fracture of the acetabulum with a dislocated hip, the primary problem is likely the wall fracture. It doesn't mean you can't also code the dislocation, but it may be subsumed. It may not be necessary. We also need to sequence on our claims the most important or most severe diagnosis first. So when you list these in your documentation, the most significant injury or component is documented first with the comorbidities to follow that. Again, whether you're in the S chapter for injuries or the M chapter for orthopedic OCs and itises, the three most common episodes of care characters are A, D, and S. They are not the same as CPT codes, meaning a new patient or initial, because A stands for active treatment of a fracture as an example. And this can be, you can append it to both the ED encounter, you can, if you see that patient every day in the hospital and don't operate, it's still actively treating that patient. So, and you also use it for a patient who delays seeking treatment. So even if the patient has been seen by you in your practice three year, within the last three years, which would be a CPT established patient, the A would be appended to the diagnosis code, even though the CPT code would say established. So divorce the ICD-10 characters A, D, and E, excuse me, A, D, and S from CPT new and established. They're not at all related. The D is for subsequent treatment, and this is, again, as I said, not the same as either a new or a established patient. It's for routine care after active treatment during the healing or recovery phase. And so D would be used as an example for a cast change or removal, removal of external or internal fixation device, medication adjustment, or other aftercare during follow-up visits. So you may use an established patient in CPT at the same time, but it isn't necessarily synonymous because you could also use a sequela for an established patient, which is the result of uh, complications or conditions that arise as a direct result of a condition, post-traumatic arthritis in an example. So the S would be in the last, uh, in the seventh character space. So new patients, initial hospital visit, established patients, subsequent hospital visits are completely different than the ICD-10 code set. Let's look at some of the medical comorbidities. For DVT, for example, there are two code sets, one for acute DVT 
and the other for chronic. And you need to specify the specific vein. And here are some examples of uh, embolism and thrombosis in the lower extremity. So left or right is there, and you can see as an example, femoral vein, iliac vein, popliteal, tibial, and there are many others that I have left off. But that gives you some example how specific you have to be in your anatomical description of where a vein is. And you can cut and paste that from um, um, a note, for example, from the lab. As I said earlier, there are combination codes, and diabetes is one of them. You have to document in diabetes whether this is type 1, type 2. There are also diabetes that are induced by chemicals or drugs, or whether they're due to an underlying condition such as malnutrition or cystic fibrosis. You need to document whether there's any associated complications, such as nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy, angiopathy, foot ulcer. And if they have two of those, it requires two separate ICD-10 codes. So you'd have diabetes type 2 with neuropathy and diabetes type 2 with retinopathy. You need to also document if you know it, that with the blood sugar control is inadequate, poorly controlled, or out of control, and don't ask me how you differentiate those through. That's a clinical judgment. <laughs> Obesity is uh, now not just obese and morbidly obese, it's stratified by every five BMI, so you need to make sure that the hospital and your clinic get height and weight of your patients, otherwise you won't be able to categorize that. Smoking, you have to, and nicotine, you have to say how the patient gets their nicotine and whether they're dependent on it. For example, do they smoke cigarettes, chew tobacco, smoke cigars, do they do snuff? Hypertension is classified by etiology, whether it's primary or essential hypertension versus secondary hypertension, for example, renovascular hypertension or endocrine. Hopefully, our medical colleagues will have already established this and we can refer to those diagnoses. And uh, you also have to say whether there's an associated comorbidity in hypertension when there, there is any heart or kidney involvement. So you can see how important this is. Now, hospital coders can't code from x-ray reports or lab reports, even if it's from the vascular lab. For example, just because the potassium is high or low doesn't mean the patient has hypo or hyperkalemia unless you put that as a treating physician in your note. And you can't use, at least in our system, arrow up K plus or arrow down HCT. You have to say and document anemia. Uh, you can cut and paste to a degree into your note, but you should interpret those lab reports. Okay, uh, so again, hospital coders cannot use the results of a lab or x-ray reports or others, even though they're signed by a physician, because those docs aren't treating physicians. So you must be interpreted by a treating physician. This is true, by the way, in ICD-9 right now, too. So this is not a change. So what does this mean for you? Well, you need to become familiar with the codes and the type of diagnoses you treat. You need to understand their differentiating characteristics and need to understand how that will affect the information you obtain, especially in terms of injuries, in terms of you know, better history, better physical exam, and your medical decision making. This will affect essentially how you're profiled as physicians when you go into practice. If you don't report comorbidities, your patient population will look very, very healthy and will look better than others. And hence, as we go to value-based purchasing, you may be paid less in the future for taking care of a healthier population. Within the university system, hospitals are reimbursed at least by Medicare and others by DRG. Those DRGs are weighted by, uh, or at least the payment for them, are weighted by what's called case mix index. And that's why capturing comorbidities and reporting them on your patients is very important to the, the hospital. If again I have time, I'll go over codex searches. So let's see uh, some more on specific fracture examples. Distal radius fractures, there are 318 codes for distal radius fractures, and they're sorted by whether they're displaced or non-displaced, right and left. The type of fracture has to be specified, whether it's stylus in the kids, torus, smiths, collies, whether it's open or closed and how open it is, the episode of care and the type of healing. And there are 108 codes for physial injuries for kids, Again, whether it's specified by whether it's a Salter-Harris 1, 2, 3, 4, or other, the higher Salter-Harris classifications, the type of healing, and the encounter type. Shaft fractures of the long bones, the fracture pattern has to be specified. So this is humerus, 
radius, ulna, femur, tibia, and fibula. And you have to specify for shaft fractures whether the pattern is transverse, oblique, spiral, comminuted, segmental, or other, meaning unspecified. In adolescence, you have to specify green stick or bent bones, such as in an ulna. Galeazzi's are there in Montasia. So these are all increased um, interpretation of your imaging. There are combination codes uh, in ICD-9, as I said, for radius and ulnar fractures, tib fibs, now each long bones fracture type and configuration is reported separately. You may have one fracture that's open, for example, the ulna, while the radius is closed. Pathological fractures classified by etiology, type, site, laterality, and episode of care. We've reviewed the osteoporotic fractures with and without pathologic fractures. Pathologic fractures are all found in the disease section. And uh, that's a review. What about arthritides? There's separate codes for pyogenic arthritis, post-infective and reactive arthropathies, rheumatoid arthritis, enteropathic arthritis, JRA, or juvenile arthritis, traumatic arth arthropathy, and osteoarthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis has 360, 306 code options. And you have to know whether they're rheumatoid factor positive or negative. If you don't, it's unspecified. You have to specify by type, laterality, manifestation, and other organ system involvement, such as we reviewed that myopathy, vasculitis, heart, or lung disease. Osteoarthritis has 90 codes and is classified by type, primary, secondary, or post-traumatic arthritis, and specific site. There are only specific osteoarthritis codes right now in ICD-10 for the hip, the knee, and the base of the thumb, the first carpal metacarpal joint. There is a code for polyosteoarthritis, but you don't use that for bilateral osteoarthritis if it's bilateral hips. That's not poly. Poly is different sites in the skeleton, not just left and right. Osteomyelitis is classified by the type, specific site, and laterality. Scoliosis is classified by type and anatomical region of the spine, spine such as infantile, juvenile, and adolescent, idiopathic, neuromuscular, etc. And I think you do a good job of that already. The location is, as you see there in the uh, uh, occipital to C2, cervical, cervical thoracic junction, thoracic, thoracal lumbar junction, lumbar or lumbosacral junction. And pain, if you don't know what the etiology for that pain is, is classified by specific site and laterality. Let's take an example of a sports coding ex example of an 18-year-old basketball player with an acutely torn medial meniscus. So in the history, you'll need to obtain how it occurred, and he tells you he was going to the hoop and in a non-contact twisting motion while playing ball in a high school game, left knee, and it's acute. The acute cares are diagnosed as a current injury. There's also in the M chapter chronic meniscal injuries, so degenerative chairs are found in chapter M, whereas acute injuries are found in chapter S under 83.2. There's some notes in there to show you what it includes and excludes, but chronic tears are excluded from the acute. The miscal tear configurations are bucket handle, peripheral, complex, other tear, and unspecified, and these codes also require A, D, or S for the seventh character. So here's some bucket handle, some tears of the medial meniscus, current injury, left knee. The first three are bucket handle, the next three are peripheral, next three are complex, and the last three are other if it doesn't fit one of those, and then you have the three seventh characters, A, D, or S. The etiology are similar to the E codes, as I said, for external causes, but in order to code how this injured, you have to know whether he fell or did not fall when going to the hoop. Did he go to the ground or not? So that requires increased specificity in your documentation. So you can see if, without a fall is W18.4, so you must elicit that from the kid. Assuming that the injured player did not fall and did not step on an object, step in a hole or opening, the cause is W18.49XA. Note the X again in the sixth character. Place of occurrence. These are diverse, but basketball court is the place of occurrence, has a code. If you want to specify further, uh, there's another code for a high school, whether it's private, public, or a state as a place of occurrence for the external cause. And the activity is engaged in was basketball and the external cause status because he's doing this for recreation, not for income, is Y99.8. So for this one medial meniscus injury, 
you really should report up to six codes to specify it. This will prevent claim denials, but this is how your documentation should be ideally if you're taking a full history. So you can see that uh, anatomical speci precise specificity for fractures is required. Cuneiforms, you have to say which cuneiform. As I said, proximal humerus would specify two, three, or four parts. If it's a long bone, you have the fracture pattern. Uh, the benefits are better profiling of you and your patient population, improved clinical information for payment and research, clearer code choices, clearer reimbursement guidelines, and hopefully, ultimately, fewer denials. So remember, CPT codes are how you get paid, and diagnosis codes are how you get denied. This is interprets or implicates a larger documentation burden for, and for physicians. We need to improve our reporting of comorbidities to substantiate complexity and risk adjust for not only our hospitals but ourselves. Incorporate laterality and episode of care in pretty much every encounter. And so, though some payers may uh, not require external cause status for most traumatic injuries, they will because payers want to know whether they're going to be the one footing the bill or whether it will be L&I or the, their patient's uh, automobile insurance, for example. So it's not what you do, it's what you document. Okay, I'm going to just do... Uh, I have to get out of there. I was going to demo Codex for you. Okay, so Codex is pretty cool for those who have it because on the left-hand side, you can search by code words, fracture pick list, arthritis pick list, spine pick list, and osteomyelitis. The a Academy is increasing those pick lists, but let me show you how this works. So if I want to go to the fracture pick list, this will help me find the code when we eventually come to picking that code. So you can see here, I don't have to know, for example, whether I should say displaced or non-displaced, although I just taught you that. But if we go uh, to the fracture, the body system, let's just take a femur. So femur is going to be hip and knee. Yes? Just because I want to show you how this work. OK. Go to your wrist forum. Go to what? Wrist forum? OK. So first of all, you watch the number of codes go down as we do this. but. All right. Next one. Didn't go down yet. Okay, so then go to your pattern. Let me, let me hit enter. Okay, pattern. Okay. Uh, nothing. There is nothing. Okay. And, uh, probably nothing, right? No. Left. Okay. Okay. Go to alignment. Alignment? Yeah, see, we're already, the pattern doesn't give me. So 15,000 codes now. Okay. Okay. Displaced is okay. 1,800. But you see, we're ilium in here already. I can. Yeah. Yep. Radius. Yeah. So now we're down to 21. Okay. Type one. Okay. Okay. So you got six codes. Uh, but it shows you to pick. You want a result? Okay. Okay, so this is what you have. So these are the ones that you could, you've limited your list here. Yeah, we've limited our list. Are we missing a bunch? Well, right here, if you look at that, okay. Yeah. I don't have a single distal radius fracture. Okay. Yeah, no wrists in there. I agree. Well, we need, we, need, we need that feedback because uh, I can't go through every code. I've gone through a lot of them. It works for the vast majority. Do you agree with that? The answer is not in my life. Okay, not in your life. All right. You want me to reset? And so I guess my question is, is this, is a, this is a great tool and has the potential to be a great tool, but it's not something that I can use Mevis, I give you, a, you email me and I'll send this back to the Academy because we're doing this for already two years and we've fixed it a lot. Um, again, it's orthopedists giving non-orthopedist information which then goes to a coder. Okay, and it's much improved. I mean, the femur works good, well, 
The arthritis pick work list works well. The big problem, we, the Epic is going to have their own, and I cannot tell you how Epic's works. But if this is the way orthopedists have ended up with it, then we may have, you know, we just have to see what Epic works with. Okay? All right, questions? As a workaround, can you take out body system and just take the risk? Yeah, first? oh, sorry, I'm just going to reset. Sorry. So, body system risk. Yeah, you can do that too. You can just you can search by a, a term, but. Uh, but you can do term and on the other one as well, right? Yeah, but wrist is uh, it won't go for wrist. You want distal radius, right? Yeah. And then type in. Let's see what how many. So there's distal radius. That's physial. The <laughs> distal, yeah, it's complete physial rest. So I don't know why physis. Okay, so the wrist is not working as well as the other. <laughs> Radial. I haven't tried it, but. And who has access to this system? Pardon? Um, all the, pretty much any attending in the department has it. Radial? Let's see what radial. So radial nerve, 354, it's going to give you too much. I'll have to try that. But for example, I know that femur, tibia, all the long bones that I've done uh, work really, really well. So you can, and it helps you, you know, pick the laterality, et cetera. Any other questions? Because I don't want to go longer than eight o'clock. Yeah. So a wise man, or at least a wise guy, has, usually says uh, when they're rolling out big things like this, what resources have been committed uh, to this? Because you would, it would appear that the onus is on the coders you know, to decipher our now much enriching documentation. And it would seem the army of these people to sort of do this. So what has been done? Huge. So the University of Washington has spent already, I think, more than 20 million on the rollout. That gives you an example of how many resources have been committed over the past three years. Does that We've hired a coders that we have hired? UWP has hired more coders as well as the hospitals. Unfortunately, as fast as we train them, they're hired away by other systems. Um, though we still have more than we started out with. So um, yes, there's tons of resources that have been dedicated. For example, I didn't have a time to go over how the University of Washington is rolling this out. I just gave you the code set. But you have champions at each of your hospital for trauma, orthopedics, and spine, for example. Uh, Howard's was one, Sean's one, um, Bransford's one. And they were trained and helped roll this out to the rest of us and are sort of the conduit for education. Uh, it's not perfect. The, additionally, every physician after April 1 will be getting feedback after there's auditing of about 10 to 15 medical records to help you improve your documentation. I didn't show you, but there are tip sheets uh, for, that you can carry in your pocket that will increase the specificity of what your, of, um, uh, your documentation. So if I quickly go down to, let me just show you. So here's an example of a tip sheet for orthopedics. You can see uh, they're going to be by diagnosis, and you can carry these in your pocket. They're available now. We want the champions in each of the sites to distribute these to all physicians and all residents. But if you want to document episode of care, it says the three columns across tell you what you need to do. If you're documenting fractures, for example, the proximal humerus in the second row tells you what to specify, fractures of the fibula. So these are out for orthopedics uh, and for spine as an example. They are available to you now at our website. They're going to be revised before October 1st with input. They're at, they're, here's the intranet site which they can be downloaded from and they were, should have been available April 1st. So really there have been a ton of resources committed. Um, we're hoping that clinics are rolled back a little bit because the increased documentation requirements, because much of this is being in, uh, rolled out with EPIC too. And from what I understand, clinic managers have been asked to roll back clinics by 50%, at least in the primary care clinics. I don't know what in the specialty clinics. Since UW went live with EPIC, they have experience, but the rollback or the decreased number of patient visits is not supposed to be 50% for the specialty clinics. I don't have an actual number, okay? Any other questions? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>